Sabbath Church. I'd like to welcome all of us here to our communion service. Uh, I have a, a word that I believe is from the Lord uh, this morning, something that's bite-sized that we can chew on as we reflect on the communion service. Is that okay? Um, it, it's taken from Exodus uh, chapter 12, really chapters 12 and 13. I don't have any uh, text on the screen uh, for you as we will not read any text, but I, I'd like for you to uh, just use your imagination uh, with me as we go back thousands of years uh, just before the Exodus event. Um, your, your people have been enslaved for more than 400 years. You're tired. You're weary. You haven't been able to make the decisions that you feel is best for you and your family. You've uh, been serving uh, someone else for y your whole life, really. Uh, that's all you know. That's all you understand. And uh, suddenly, uh, this man that you've heard about, uh, he's a, a legend, if you will, waltzes back into town and demands from Pharaoh to let the Israelite people go free. You've heard about Moses, almost like a, a, a living legend. You, you, you haven't met him. Uh, you, you've heard that he used to be a, a prince in Egypt, and then all of a sudden he, he killed uh, one of his fellow Egyptians, and, and he's run. Uh, all you've heard about him is that he's a ghost of far past. Since he left, no one has heard of him. No one has spoken to him. No, he, he hasn't answered any emails, hasn't texted anyone back. You haven't heard anything of or from Moses until he waltzes back in town from Midian, right back down there into Egypt, and he demands uh, from the king of Egypt to let his people go free. And of course, you know who your pharaoh is. You, you know who your king is. You, you know it's not going to happen that easy. And, and, and Pharaoh says no over and over and over again. Moses says, well, you know, there, there's going to be some judgment then. There's going to be some judgment. And so they, they go through these series of plagues. You know the story, ten of them, starting with the Nile River and all of the water in Egypt turning into blood. And uh, there were some, some frogs and, and gnats and flies Livestock was struck. There was thunder and hail and lightning. Uh, all, all of these crazy plagues. And you would think, j just me, just me, if I'm Pharaoh and all of these things are happening and, and my, my magicians can only replicate the first three of them. They only replicate three of them. That's it. All of the other ones, they, 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 they tell you straight up. If you read the word of God, uh, in Exodus 12, they tell you, look, we, we, we've served some gods in our day, but this God is unlike any other God we've ever encountered. We, we, we can't keep up with him. He's doing too much. Uh, we, 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 we can't replicate all of the things that, 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 that this God is doing. But yet and still, and here's what, here's what baffles me about sin. And I'm not just talking about your sin. I'm talking about my sin also. Sin makes you stupid. All right, y'all know what I'm talking about. Like silly in your mind. Right? Like, so silly, you should be locked up in an institution somewhere in a straight jacket because you keep knocking your head on the same wall and wondering why things aren't going well. Well, duh. Sin, sin is silly. Sin is silly. And, and so we, we, finally get, we finally get to the very last plague. And unlike the other plagues, this last plague has a setup to it. Like the, the, the word of God is building up a suspense. This is almost like the apex uh, of the book of, of Exodus. And there's this setup to this last plague. You understand that this last plague is the striking of the firstborn males in all of Egypt. And the Bible says from, uh, from the greatest of them, meaning Pharaoh's house, to the least of them, meaning uh, to the least of the slaves' house. No household would be spared in this last plague. And so Moses, in the setup to this, uh, to this last plague, Moses institutes what we call now uh, the Passover meal. 
And this Passover meal was designed to, uh, in a way, protect, and we're going to go through, I have three, uh, three points that you could take away uh, from this message today, but all three of these points are surrounding uh, the Passover meal. And so the first one, the first one is that the Passover meal was designed to be a family meal, family so, you know, in, in Western society, we've grown so individualistic that many times we fail to understand or comprehend that salvation, while yes, we cannot be saved because of somebody else, but God often uses the circles that we are in to save ourselves and to save other people that are in that same circle, right? You know, salvation was never designed to be individualistic, never designed for that. And so when, when at the Passover, uh, you know, they're eating this lamb, they're eating some bitter herbs, they're eating a, uh, this apple uh, mixture, which they, uh, the Jewish people continue to eat the same meal today in commemoration for, uh, for the Passover. Uh, and, and so what, what would happen is that the father, the, the, the male, the, the head of household in the home would gather his whole family together and eat this last Passover meal. This is the last meal that they ate in Egypt. And the whole family is, is, is in the house uh, by themselves and um, over the threshold of the door, you know the story, as they killed the lamb that they're currently eating in this meal, uh, they dip some hyssop, a bunch of hyssop in the blood uh, of the lamb. They would catch it in a bowl and dip that bunch of hyssop in the blood and around the mantle uh, is that what it's called, the mantle or the lintel? What, how, how do you call that thing? The, the threshold, something like that. Around the three edges of the door, you would put blood all around it. And what that would mean for the father is that, okay, when you pass over, Lord, I want you to protect not just me, but protect my whole family. Everybody that's in this household with me. And so, and it shows a care and concern of the head of household. Now, fellas, let me talk to you. The responsibility for saving our family is on us. Okay, I preached a message uh, several weeks back. I think it was in 2018, maybe in November or so, uh, when I talked about Noah. Noah built the ark. So that, here's what Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11 says, so that he could save his family. All right, and so when we are being saved, gentlemen, or other heads of household, don't ever forget that salvation isn't just for you, but we're put here on earth to save our entire families. And that's exactly what happened during that Passover meal. Uh, the heads of household, those who put the blood on their doorpost, uh, their families were saved automatically. Who says amen? amen? A second point about this story uh, that is applicable to us today is that the meal that they were eating was to be eaten quickly. All right, don't miss that detail in the story. In fact, this um, tradition that we have of eating unleavened bread, you know, these matzo crackers that don't really do much for you in the belly. Amen. <laughs> you know, the, the reason why we eat that is because the tradition started right here in, in the Passover meal in Exodus chapter 12, uh, where they were to eat unleavened bread. The reason why they were to eat that is because they were to eat as if they didn't have much time left where they were. You know, and many of us probably take this for granted because when we need some bread, most of us, I would bet, don't go to the oven and pop the bread in ourselves, right? Okay, do I have you correctly? Most of us will go to Giant or to Weiss or to Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, wherever you shop. We'll buy some bread. We don't have to worry about nothing. We're not needing nothing. We're not, you, you know what I'm saying? All right, it takes a lot of work. I get it. But, but we lose some of the uh, symbolism there because we don't bake our own bread. When you bake bread, my mom used to bake bread when I was a kid. I used to love it. The, 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 the smell would just waft throughout the whole house. You could be sleeping and smell bread in your sleep and you wake up. Come on and say amen, somebody. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? But, but I, I discovered that uh, it took a while for my mom to bake bread when I was a kid because after she needed it, 
before she put it in the oven, she would put it in its, uh, in its case, uh, in its pan, and put a kitchen towel on top of it, and she would let it rise. Okay, right? And rising takes time. It just takes time. You can't rush that process. The yeast in there cannot be rushed. And so, uh, and so baking bread takes time. And so God told them, he said, listen, we don't have time to, to, to let the bread rise. You can knead it. You can put it in the oven. But I don't want you to use any yeast in it because I'm about to get you up out of Egypt in just a short time. You don't have time for, for, to, to, to be wasting. You don't have time for that. Right? And that's why they ate unleavened bread. Because they had to eat the meal as if God was about to do something on the earth right then and there. And so I, I submit to us today, the lesson that we can learn from that is that, look, we, we don't have time. Like, literally, we don't have time to be messing around with folk. Right? We believe, and, and part of our fundamental beliefs, first of all, as Christians, but especially as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that Jesus is coming soon. And there are some things that we ought not get wrapped up in. There are some things that we ought not get entangled with. Right? What, what does Hebrews say? I think it's Hebrews chapter 12 uh, and verse 1 and 2. He says that... Um, uh, that that uh, we ought to run the race without any encumbrances on us. Like, take the weight off of yourself. We are running a race uh, w w without, uh, without the, time, the benefit of time on our side. Jesus is coming soon. Folk, if you don't believe that, there's something wrong with you. And I know, I know, by the way, we've been saying this for such a long time. We've been saying this for hundreds of years. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. No, when you look at the world today, if you don't believe that Jesus has to come in order for this world to be set straight, then we've got another problem on our hands. And so, so Moses told them to eat this meal, he says, with their loins girded. What that is, uh, you know, they, they wore a, uh, there was a standard uh, cloth that they, uh, that they wore, kind of flowing, uh, almost shirt-like. It was a garment that they wrapped around their waist and, you know, kind of tucked it between cre crevices and whatnot. I'm trying not to be crass. You understand what I'm talking about? Uh, and so they, they ate this. This was basically their underwear. And he's saying, listen, eat with your underwear on. Don't take your shoes off. Have your staff in hand. Eat it quickly because you're about to get up out of here. So as we eat today, let's remember that Jesus is coming very, very soon. Very, very soon. Last thing, last thing. You know, um, as, a, as a child, um, for whatever reason, I, I was fearful, to whatever extent, of, of God. You know, you read some stories, especially in the, in the Old Testament, uh, and really, you know, God, God did some, some, some strange stuff in the New Testament also, if you read deeply. But, you know, when, when I read the Old Testament, I, I believed that God was a God that was ready to strike me down. That's just me. Uh, I don't, it may not necessarily be you. It might be you. It, it might be me. And we notice that in this Passover story that God destroyed people in the story. Amen? We can't get around that. God, God does destroy. In fact, God calls destruction a strange act. Don't miss that in Scripture. He calls it a strange act, but an act that he does nonetheless. All right? We don't have the time to get into all the theology and uh, uh, of all of those kinds of things. But it is a strange act. But nonetheless, God destroys people in the story, those that did not have the blood covering their household. When we go to the end of the story, we see that uh, even Pharaoh's own son, God promised that from the greatest to the least, he said, if you do not have the blood covering your household, and lo and behold, uh, Pharaoh's household was not covered in blood, therefore his firstborn son was struck down. God does destroy. That's just a reality. But that's not the point of this story. That's not the point of this story. And when we talk about the angel of death, when we discuss it, when we hear about it, when we read about it, my assumption was growing up 
that God, that God was ready and waiting to destroy those that did not have the blood on their doorpost. Right? Like he was at the edge of his seat waiting to destroy them. That, that was my assumption. That was my assumption. However, however, um, the Passover story isn't about God looking to strike people down. That's not what it's about. In fact, the Passover story is actually about his protection for those that love him and those that, uh, whom he loves also. Here it is. Let me, tell, let me share with you why. There is a Hebrew word that we get our uh, Passover word from. And that Hebrew word is Peshach. Everybody say Peshach. This Hebrew word can have at least three meanings. All right. Number one, what we've uh, assigned it is to pass over. Meaning God came to your house. He was looking to see, looking for an excuse to destroy and because he didn't have the excuse, because the blood was covering, then he went on to the next house, waiting to destroy that house. And if the blood was covering that house, he went on to the next house. And when he saw a house without blood, that's when he was ready and waiting to destroy. Okay? That could be an assumption. And so that, that's one meaning of the word Peshach. And that's the usual meaning that we have ascribed uh, to what we call Passover. However, there are two other meanings to this word that we normally don't associate with this Passover story. Are you ready? Here it is. Number one, or the, let me say number two, because we already discussed number one. Number two, the second meaning is to have compassion on. Okay? The third meaning is to protect. All right? And so when we look at the Hebrew grammar, th this word for Passover... I think we've done the word injustice because it normally, we, we kind of have this connotation that God is at the edge of his seat waiting to strike lightning down on somebody when that's not the kind of God that we serve. Again, God's destroying act, the scripture calls it a strange act, an act that he does not want to do. In fact, you think about it, you know, why, why have we been waiting? You know, we just talked about the fact that we've been saying for so long that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Why has he delayed his coming? All right. Y'all don't want to be honest. Here it is. Because he's waiting for Troy. All right. Here we go. He's waiting for you, waiting for me, waiting for folk out here that don't know the God that we serve. He's waiting at the edge of his seat so that he can give somebody a chance to save them. That's why he's delayed his coming. It's not because uh, God is a liar or God doesn't want to come to save. No, he definitely wants to come. But when he comes to save, he wants to save as many folk as possible. Passover, Peshach. It's not just about him waiting at the edge of his seat to destroy. He's waiting at the edge of his seat to protect folk and to have compassion on us. Yeah. Passover is about his protection. Peshach. Last thing as I close, this, this word Peshach when we translate it or transliterate it into Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in, we get to a phrase that Jesus used. His last time going to Jerusalem, Jesus begins to weep over the city. He knows he's going there to die. It, that, that, that one, if there was one thing that Jesus knew, he knew that. He knew he was going there to die. And, and as he approaches the city, he's at the top of the hill, and he's about to go down into the valley, the, into the Garden of Gethsemane, into the valley, and in, into the city of Jerusalem. And he sees Jerusalem right there shining bright as any city would. And he begins to weep, and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have loved to gather you under my arms as a hen gathers her chicks. That word there gathered is the same Hebrew word that we find right here in Passover 
to have compassion on, to protect. How I would have loved to protect you as a hen gathers her little chicks under her wings so that it can't get killed or can't get run over. As a hen gathers, as a hen peshek, as a hen passes over, as a hen protects and has compassion on her children. That's what I wanted from you. As we eat today, don't ever forget that we serve a God who is a compassionate God. Forgiving generations, having compassion and mercy on those who love him, even to the thousandth generation. That's the kind of God we serve.